The release of Space Harrier and Million Dollar Kid on January 6th, 1989, marks the end of an era. Literally. The following day, January 7th, Emperor Hirohito died, bringing an end to the Showa era. What's that got to do with 8-bit gaming? Well, not a whole lot directly. But the end of the Showa era is considered a big cultural shift in Japan. Hirohito was emperor from 1926, led his country into fascism, and although he was reduced to a figurehead, he was still emperor during the prosperous 80s. As the Heisei era quickly became mired in stagnation, paying the bills that came due from the Showa era's excesses, the Showa era became the focus of both nostalgia and conservatism. When it comes to video games, the end of the Showa era is often thought of as the end of that first generation of gaming. The people who played Space Invaders in the arcade, obsessed over Zevius, experienced the proliferation of the Famicom boom, waited in those long lines for Dragon Quest III. Those are the Showa-era gamers. Now personally, I think there's a better dividing line for video games in 1987. Nintendo locking down their licensees, a proper competitor to the Famicom arrives, and the Famicom fad becomes just another product. But the cultural context of the Showa era is what makes Japanese Famicom fans draw the line at the start of 1989. What game do we have to bring a close to the Showa era? It's Million Dollar Kid, a gambling game. And wow, that is a terrible visual effect. I actually switched this over to my original model Famicom to see if it was an artifact of the AV Famicom. Nope, it just looks this horrible. It's based on a comic that's about a Japanese gambler who travels to Las Vegas to make a fortune. The comic actually ended over six months before the game was released. Sofal wasn't exactly striking as the iron was hot in this case. If you want to be really technical, the title in Japanese is Hyakman Dollar Kid, but the number is given in numerals here, so I'm sticking with Million Dollar. Million Dollar Kid has four different casino games in it, Slots, Roulette, Blackjack, and Poker. And its big innovation is that there's a quest mode. In it, you travel to casinos around the world and have to defeat all of the gamblers at each location. You have this Dragon Quest style view where you can walk around the casino, and you can choose to play a table game or talk to people and challenge them. Honestly, it doesn't add a whole lot to the game. The gamblers only accept your challenge in a certain order. So you have to find this woman first who will let you play poker against her, or you can go play blackjack against the house. You can also walk up to the roulette table or use any of the slot machines in the area, but the gamblers don't challenge you to those. In the challenge, you have to take all of the other gamblers' money. That can actually take quite a while, too. If you were playing it straight, you have roughly a 50-50 chance of winning any given hand. But the computer isn't good at the psychology of poker. You can watch the character for different tells to let you know if you should fold or raise as much as you can. But knowing your opponent has a bad hand doesn't help you when your hand is even worse. And the computer doesn't seem to get pushed into folding very much. You can't really bluff it. So what the poker comes down to is waiting for a good hand, then raising it as far as you can go, and then going back to low safe bets. And these gambling battles take a long time. Your first one is against this woman who has 10 times the starting cash that you do. You could easily go through that starting cash in two hands. I tried to build up some stake on the slot machine, since video game slots are the loosest slots in town, but I didn't have much luck there. You get a game over when you run out of cash, so I also tried placing big bets on the roulette wheel, thinking that I could reset when I lost. The interface in this game is not good. There's a very noticeable delay on all inputs, and actually placing a bet is more difficult than it should be. You'd hit left and right to change the denomination of the chip, up and down to place and remove chips, and A to confirm the bet. There's a minimum and maximum bet in all the games, which makes the whole thing trickier than it should be. At the roulette table, for example, the maximum you can place on any point is $10, and you can only have four bets on the table. On the slot machine, you can press up and down to very slowly see the payouts. 
The B button inserts coins, and the A button pulls the handle. Poker is always 5 card draw, so the A button selects the cards you want to hold, and you press B once you're set. You can also press B to fold when it's time for you to bet. Blackjack at least is all menu driven. Besides quest mode, there's free mode where you just select one of the four games to play. If you need to stop playing, you can get a password at any time. Hit select to bring up this menu, and this is where you can choose to go to other casinos, or get your password. There is a sequel to Million Dollar Kid, but it was only released on the NES, and so never made it back to Japan. Million Dollar Kid is really rough. Comparing it to our previous casino game, Viva Las Vegas, this one at least includes poker, so there's two games where there's at least some skill involved. But the presentation in Million Dollar Kid is atrocious. Japanese players note that the game is riddled with typos, and particularly infamous is how the game seems to switch back and forth between whether the player is you, the player themselves, or the main character from the Million Dollar Kid comic. If it wasn't for the fact that this is the very last game of the Showa era, I doubt anyone would remember Million Dollar Kid at all.